How are you pregnant? There's the dragon waiting on the baby to be born. The mother goes into the wilderness to be hidden and protected from this force that wants to kill the life associated with her. There is a, a really complex history of a lot of violence happening in the name of Christianity. The cross is not inherently a religious symbol. Ago, a young woman was found wandering, barefoot, pregnant, and alone on a barren stretch of highway a hundred miles from the nearest. Oh. We lost the engine. This really dangerous mess between this Satanist group and this extremist Christian group who are both sort of uh, inhabiting this space. And I think it's interesting because what we've seen historically with cult groups and extremist groups in general is when someone goes to tell the truth about, discover, expose in any way for the sake of like freeing someone or just bringing the common knowledge, the horrors that exist within these either extremist groups or other groups, oftentimes the person doing the investigating or trying to find the information can find themselves in a couple of dangerous points. One is being sucked into the very thing they were trying to expose or trying to interrogate, uh, or even worse, fall victim to it in terms of the harm that is caused and exposed this. And we've seen this time after time with extremist groups, even in the Christian form or cult groups, how people go to investigate or expose, and they really have to realize they're putting themselves in harm's way as they do it. There's a great risk when you go to expose and uncover. Satan is always presented in contrast to the characters and qualities of God, right? So the things that we know God to be, Satan directly opposes that, opposes that in character, opposes that in the way that he deals with people. So God desires to bring about life. Satan wants to bring about death. God's design is that there is uh, peace and Satan's design is that there is chaos and harm. And then one of the ultimate differences is that God moves by truth, by us having truth as individuals, by us moving in truth as communities, and then even the world moving in truth and that God is truth. Satanus indivicante. He walks into temple, or a type of temple space ascribed to Satan. And on the inside is this pile of babies and sacrifice. In fact, there is a major portion in, in scripture, I think one of them is even in, in Deuteronomy, where God is saying, don't adapt these other practices of these cultures because they sacrifice babies to their God. That he doesn't support the sacrificing of children, that he doesn't support human sacrifice. And that sacrifice has a role in the way God understands sort of humanity, which we can probably get into. But when I see that picture, it reminds me of the time where God is saying, this is not the type of sacrifice that I condone. That's not to me. That's what other people do to their gods or to, to Satan. So they would literally offer up their young sons and daughters to their deity. And God's like, no, it is never out of God's desire for the child to be sacrificed. And it's never out of God's belief that that is something that actually has value or merit. Because in the end, God says, hey, no, don't do that. In fact, God says it this way, don't lay a hand on him. Like, don't even touch him, Abraham. He says, I have prepared this animal to be sacrificed. The only human who will then be sacrificed as being approved by God will be Jesus, who is the son of God. Why? Because that was the plan all along. One of my favorite scriptures is John 10 and 10. The enemy comes to steal kill and destroy. That's the threefold sort of purpose and reason why the enemy is doing what he does or Satan. We refer to him internally as the enemy. He says, but I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Even when Jesus gets up and he reads the scroll in the temple from Isaiah and he's announcing sort of what his purpose is as the son of God here on earth, he says a similar thing, right? That the spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to preach the gospel. And he says to, to set at liberty those that are captive is one of the things. So there's this idea that like when when God and Jesus is involved, there should be a life giving element to it, not this sacrificial element or not this death. So when he says, God wants me dead, the response to that would be like, hey, no, God wants life and 
back to John 10 and 10, Jesus says, and life more abundantly. So the first part is life, which is life. And that could mean life eternal, but also life here. And it also means quality of life, life in harmony, life in peace, life in alignment with God and with others and things like that. Rip the devil from her belly and crush it beneath your boat tail. But one of the things I think is so fascinating where he says to crush the baby under your heels. Now, this harkens back to Genesis. And what happens in the Genesis narrative is we typically know that, right, Adam and Eve, they eat the fruit after being deceived by the serpent represents the Satan figure or the enemy, as we would call it. After that decision, the result, the consequences for that decision to disobey God are a series of curses. And those curses are more so about God saying, here's what's gonna happen as a result of that decision. He says all these things, right? You're gonna have to work the land. Before then, uh, the Genesis narrative explains to us that things naturally grew. They naturally came up. You didn't have to work for your food. You didn't have to work for fruit. You didn't have to work to eat off the land. So he says, now you're gonna have to work the land. Then he starts to talk about how life's gonna be conceived, that it's gonna be difficult and all these things. But after God gets done explaining to Adam and Eve what those consequences will be for the human race or for humanity, then God turns to the serpent and says, you are to blame for this too. Like they have their part in it, but so do you. So let me tell you what your consequences are. And he says that the plan is already in place, that the seed of a woman is going to be the serpent's ultimate punishment. Essentially, a someone who comes through human flesh is going to be the ultimate punishment and undoing of the serpent or of Satan. Who are we talking about? Well, we're talking about Jesus, the son of God, who's going to come in the story way later. And what he says is a couple of things. You're going to bruise his heel, which means you're going to have an impact on him. What are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus being crucified that Jesus is going to suffer at the hands of not just human beings, but of all that which is evil, apocalyptic writings. That category of study broadly draws on writings like Revelation and others to help us try to wrestle with certain questions, like what's gonna happen at the end of the world? When is Jesus returning? We know that Jesus came and he died on the cross, but the Christian belief is that Jesus will return to eventually establish the actual kingdom. The first time he taught us his kingdom in terms of principles and ways and orders and precepts, and he didn't come to actually establish a physical kingdom, but he will come back. And so what's that going to look like? And when, and what will that process be? What's going to happen when evil is given opportunity to just wreak its course on the earth? Will there be an end to this earth and the reestablishment of another one. Where do people who believe in faith fall in that? What do we do throughout that whole process? So a bunch of different interpretations and beliefs as to what that might be. But two things I think is interesting. In the game, they have this whole response because they believe that this is the beginning of the end. It's the beginning of prophecy being revealed in Revelation. But I have two thoughts on that. One, what we know is that scripture gives us that we will see signs of end times. One, but two, Jesus says, no man knows the day or the hour. He's there. Who are you? He had Judas inscribed on his chest. Noth is coming back with Mary. He'll hurt her and I'll talk. And that corresponds with the moment where he says he's going to try to get me to talk. That's sort of like this act of being a sellout or a betrayer. And what we know in the biblical narrative is that Judas is one of the 12 disciples who, for a sum of money, he tells the group that's looking for Jesus so they can lead him to crucifixion. He tells them where Jesus is so they can arrest him and take him to be killed. It's interesting because it was that betrayal that sort of sets into motion the rest of the events, which is how Jesus will end up being killed. And the Bible goes on to help us understand that Judas had this moment where conscience kicks in as he realizes what that betrayal did. He walks up to Jesus, gives him a kiss, and then that's how they know they arrest him from there. He says, interesting that I would be betrayed um, with a kiss. But he has this line where he says, you have to kill me. He's saying that he looks to dying as his only way out of his misdeeds, as his only way out of being a, a sellout. It's interesting because that's what happens in the Bible, is that Judas is one of the few um, sort of suicides that we have. <laughs> 
recorded in the biblical narrative because the Bible says that after realizing how crazy what he did to Jesus was, and after realizing how brutal Jesus's murder is, and that he's kind of got some blood on his hands for that, he takes the money, he tries to give it back to the leaders who gave it to him. He's trying to do everything to rid his conscience, and eventually it overtakes him, and uh, he goes into a field and he hangs himself and uh, commits suicide in that way because it was just too much for him to bear that he had done that. Let her go. Oh God, Mary, I'm sorry. Interesting is Revelation 12 tells this story um, about John who writes Revelation seeing and describing these signs. Now what's fascinating in the game is that the game is treating this as though it is literal and you have some people who stand by very literal interpretations versus John describing it as a sign which means that everything he describes are elements or symbols of something else and we should read it symbolically. So when you have people who have two different interpretations, it starts there from, do you have a literal reading of scripture, a literal reading of the end of days and times and destruction and hell and those things, or do we have a symbolic reading? That these are just signs telling us more about the story of faith in Jesus. So in Revelation 12, the writer John describes that there is a woman who is about to give birth and the woman as she's about to give birth there is this dragon who's waiting to kill the child as soon as it's born some groups that believe that the woman being talked about in Revelation 12 is uh, the Virgin Mary. And is I think there's like a, a moon and 12 stars in the symbol that John, the writer of Revelation is describing. And so sometimes you'll even see that in iconography, like Mary with stars to suggest that that's how she's presented to us in Revelation. That's one way that Christians look at that. So I think it's interesting that they call her Mary because there's a whole group of people that interpret that scripture that way, even down to the child. Some people have interpreted that text of the child to represent Jesus and the dragon is not a real dragon it's a symbol of how they attempted to kill Jesus before he was old <laughs> There is a, a really complex history of a lot of violence happening in the name of Christianity. That's not something that I see sanctioned by God or the spirit of God um, or character of God is looking at this lineage of, of torture and stuff like this in that way. So I find that interesting, right? Looking at this torture in this temple and sometimes that has happened where you're in this space that's supposed to be life giving and instead of it giving life, it actually breeds torture, albeit emotional, physical, economic, whatever. You ain't been transubstantiated yet. Transubstantiation refers to the process of consecrating bread and wine. It has to do with the Eucharist or communion, as we would call it in my faith tradition. And the belief in those uh, Catholic spaces or in those Orthodox spaces is that when you consecrate, that means to set aside for special intention, for spiritual use to pray over, to mark for spiritual use. When you consecrate the bread and wine, it has this change that it goes through from being just bread and wine to actually becoming the body and blood of Jesus Christ. So you have some sections of Christianity who in their reading of scripture, because Jesus at the Last Supper says, this is my body, which was broken for you, and this cup is the New Testament in my blood. There's a group of Christians that believe that when you consecrate the bread and wine, it goes through this change and it becomes the literal body and blood of Jesus. And that process, that change is called transubstantiation. First, we gotta get him on that cross. Get my hammer and nails. Let's get on up that hill to cross and die and he will be buried. This is another thing, right, which is biblical, but is misinterpreted, interpreted wrongly, or taken to the extreme. The cross and crucifixion is interesting because it's not a practice that begins with Jesus. The cross is not inherently a religious symbol. In fact, it is a very, very, very problematic symbol because it's a cultural one. It's a symbol of torture. It became a form of punishment hundreds upon thousands of years before we see Jesus. And then it's Alexander the Great who discovers this method of crucifixion of public death by hanging someone, nailing them to a cross, allowing them to hang. And then Alexander the Great sort of exposed it to the Mediterranean. And then eventually Rome gets a hold of this practice and the Roman empire kind of like perfects, if that's even good language, 
this model of killing people publicly on a cross. The cross is a symbol of shame. It's a symbol of debasing someone's value because we sort of read in history that the Romans uh, didn't really crucify their own. They crucified slaves. They crucified people who they had conquered. And the design was public, shame, brutal. And it's sad to see it in this context taken to the extreme because any crucifixion outside of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is not one that we hail or celebrate or even deem necessary. The cross is a symbol for Christians of this intersectionality of the two most important relationships for faith, right? There is the vertical relationship and the horizontal relationship and there's where they intersect. The vertical relationship represents our relationship with God, being in alignment and in right standing or fellowship or harmony with God. The horizontal part of the cross represents our relationship with each other. That it's not just about me living a good life so God is like, yeah, it's also about me treating other people right and living in harmony with people and creation. That's why Jesus said that the greatest commandment was that you would love the Lord your God and then love your neighbor as yourself. And that intersection is you, the self, our decisions, our loving of self and our seeking to love God and understand God. We have names and identifiers for Jesus like bread of life, Messiah. Jesus calls himself the true vine. The living word is another way to refer to Jesus. The well of living water is a conversation Jesus has where he describes himself and he says, the water I give, you will thirst no more. So there are a number of ways Jesus describes himself or names through scripture given to Jesus. And um, that's one of them is that Jesus is the light. And then what's interesting is through Jesus and through Jesus relationship with those who believe in him, the light lives in us. And so Jesus is the light of the world. And then when we carry Jesus, the belief is that we carry that light. You're pregnant. How are you pregnant? There's the dragon waiting on the baby to be born. But then when the baby is born, the mother goes into the wilderness for a period of time to be hidden and protected from this force that wants to kill the life associated with her. Sight, that's what this is drawing on in the wilderness, running, looking for protection with the baby. And uh, that's something that I think is interesting with Revelation 12. Different interpretations, but that's the core that we're trying to make there. Gameology, that's a wrap on another episode of Experts React. I always love coming to hang out with you and taking a wild ride through some crazy games, but looking at them through the lens of faith. For more Experts React, go to Facebook and YouTube. If you'd like to connect with me more and hear more about what I have to offer with faith and culture, you can follow me at Princeton Parker on Instagram or go to PrincetonParker.com. 